May 28th, 2021, and on this week's edition of the FritzCast, I welcome back Spike Cohen. You are the power, Spike Cohen. Tasha's spouse, Spike Cohen. (laughs) I had to throw that one out there. I'm very, very sorry. I love Spike Cohen. Spike is just a beast when it comes to talking about things. When it comes to talking about all things libertarian, he's off the charts. He can go on and on and on. Uh, Just, just... A wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And I was very excited to have him back on. I'm really excited because in about two week, two weekends from now, he's going to be here in Delaware. If you're in the tri-state area, I'm inviting you. This is your invite from your old pal Fritz. Come on down June 4th, Liberty Speaks event that's being hosted at Pisa Dilly. A winery and Vineyard, sponsored by Anthem Planning and the Libertarian Party of Delaware, right ahead of the Liber- right ahead of the Libertarian Party of Delaware's convention, which is happening on June fifth, in which Spike Cohen is also speaking again, twice speaking now. This dude's got a full plate. This dude has a full plate. But we had a great epic conversation about uh, reflecting on on his campaign as vice presidential nominee for the Libertarian Party in this past election cycle, the evolution from then till now with the Libertarian Party, the biggest issues that are going on right now that libertarians need to strike on, uh, and so much more. And one thing that he wanted me to throw in here that we were saying at, at the close of the show after I had stopped recording, uh, because Memorial Day weekend is coming up, you know, Honor the fallen by not sending people to these endless wars that have nothing to do with the preservation of our freedom. If there's one message I can have, if there's one true respect that I believe that we can have for the men and women who volunteer to serve this nation in that capacity, it would be to not empower our politicians, to send them in harm's way in any quadrant of this world that has nothing to do with us, which every passing day it seems like they try to find ways to sink our fingers into another region of this world to instill the American uh, way or the American touch. And it's just, it's not good. It's not good, and I could go on and on about that, but I won't. Because you came for Spike Cohen. Spike Cohen is uh, what you came for. Or you may have come for Tasha's spouse. Or you might have come for that. So, so if you did, anyway, tighten your seatbelts and get ready. Because it's happening right here, right now. Spike Cohen, welcome back to the FritzCast. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming back, man. Uh, last time we had you on here, you were a, uh, you were the vice presidential nominee for the Libertarian Party. We had a great episode where we talked yep. about you and uh, and Joe's campaign. Um, let's do a little before I do anything else. Before I do anything else, I have to ask Tasha's spouse. Where did this come from? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I am Tasha's spouse. Um, so, uh, for those who don't know, Tasha Cohen is my lovely, beautiful and brilliant wife. And I knew this would happen when I got the nomination. Uh, I told her the only thing I'm going to need you to come to 
is the convention and then the you know if we have like a watch party for election night which we did and maybe once or twice on the trail but i'm not going to expect you to come and you know come along the, the problem is and i i knew this was going to happen she is so amazing and so beautiful and so caring and so magnetic and so wonderful and every every good adjective that's out there that people are drawn to her and they love her and they love her more than me so i knew what would happen <laughs> is that eventually people would be like you have to have her with you come on please bring her with so we literally on the campaign trail had people saying is tasha going to be there is tasha going to be there because we want to do a thing with tasha so it it just kind of became that and and so it, and it's been that way even uh post uh post election so back in march i was at the libertarian party of alabama convention in huntsville really great convention really cool venue that they picked uh i think record turnout for the for the state all sorts of new energized people but, but in the uh in the convention uh program uh, it, it has all the, and and when i got there the chair of the party laura she she said I need to talk with you. And I thought, well, this doesn't sound good at all. And uh, and so she said, I, I need to show you something and I'm not sure what you're gonna think of it. And so she she pulled out this, this uh, one of the copies of the program and I, I'm flipping through it and she goes, go go to where it has you. And I, I look on it and it's got John Mons who is a um, was one of the potential presidential candidates and one of my favorite people in the movement and then me under it. And I looked and I thought, what is it that I'm under John Mons? He's the one opening and I'm closing. That makes, and then I look and it says, it doesn't say Spike Cohen. It says Tasha Cohen's spouse. <laughs> and then in the description, the bio about me, it never says my name. It says Tasha's spouse, her spouse, the spouse, whatever it says in it. And I, and anywhere I was mentioned in the entire program, it would say Tasha Cohen's spouse. I laughed my ass off. I thought it was the funniest thing. She's like, oh, you're okay with it? I'm like, oh no, this is funny. So I, my mistake was instead of just letting the joke die, I took a picture of it and posted it on my social media and said, hey, look at how Libertarian Party of Alabama is doing me down here. And uh, and it went viral. And now everywhere I go, it's Tasha's spouse, Tasha's spouse, Tasha's husband. Uh, it became Tasha and guest uh, in, um, where was that? Wisconsin, I was and guest. Uh, I'm waiting for it to just turn into Tasha Cohen, et cetera, or, or et al. Um, and where I'm just a, a basic like passing reference to the possible existence of me. But no, it's it, it is the reality of how much I don't think anyone sees it as a slight towards me and it's and it's tongue in cheek, but it's also just how amazing she is. She's not just beautiful and smart and caring and brilliant. She's just an amazing person. She's that's why I picked her. And uh, most recently in Colorado, we had a, um, a homeless event that she put together or that she uh, helped to put together with the Libertarian Party of Colorado and a group called Helping Hands for Dignity, where, you know, they asked her if she'd like to speak and, and, and do a, uh, you know, do like a breakout session. And she said, I, I don't really want to give a speech, but what I'd like to do is give some homeless people in the area and some people that are helping them the opportunity to talk about what they're going through. And that's exactly what happened. We had some folks from some homeless camps in Denver that actually came and talked about what their experience is like. And, uh, and Regan Benson, who uh, runs Helping Hands there, is uh, she talked about what, you know, how she's helping them. Then the following day, I went out to the camp and actually met with some of the people that I met and some other people that lived there. But that, that was started by, you know, Tasha not wanting to make it about herself or what she thinks, but about how she wants to try to help others and give them a platform and a voice. She's just an amazing woman. And, and I think it's, uh, I, I love that she's getting the attention because she deserves all of it. No, nah, no, nah, I, I love, I love the work that she and you are doing. Um, and, and if you want to be billed as Tasha's spouse, I see that as a badge of honor at this point. Man. I, I look forward to the day that I have my name back. I mean, that, that's nice. I, I don't mind. I don't mind when people put Spike Cohen. That's, that's good. Cause that is my name, but yeah, no, she, I find it funny. And, uh, you know, I pretend like, Oh, you know, I can't believe, it. but I, I find it funny. And, uh, and I just, like I said, I, she, if there's anyone that deserves top billing above me, it's Tasha. She's amazing. Absolutely, man. Well, I want to do some reflecting uh, because last time I had you on, you were running for vice presidential, you know, yes. uh, as the nominee with Joe Jorgensen. And I had the opportunity to interview Joe as well. Um, that was back in like July or something, wasn't it? You were you were one of my earlier, even before the convention. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yep I was. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and I was very, very ecstatic to have you both on, uh, even though it was separately, but it, it was still yeah. awesome. Uh, 
in, in your reflection on that, because obviously you have to look back and you have to reflect. Um, you're, you're going around now. I, I see you're going around to, to all these state conventions, your keynote speaking. Um, you're, you're coming to the events here in Delaware, which I'm going to speak about in a little bit. Uh, yep. But when you're looking back at the run, how do you, how do you feel about it? How do you feel you and Joe did uh, in, in that election? I think in retrospect, we could have done better. I do focus on the positives. Um, and those positives are we saw a in the in that year's time, we saw a nearly 50 percent growth uh, in party membership. Uh, and we aren't the only ones responsible for that. But I'd like to think that we played at least a, a small part in that. Um, we saw a double digit growth of uh, the number of people uh, that are registered as libertarians in their state, which is actually huge because the number of registered libertarians is anywhere from 50 to 100 times higher the number of libertarian party members which is a problem we need to work on but it just goes to show the movement is growing um we had uh what else we we have a, a record high number of libertarian elected officials um it built the groundwork for what happened this past april where uh the, the races that we targeted in the april special election we won almost half of them we actually won a higher percentage of either the Republican or Democrat parties, which is unheard of. We actually outperform the Republicans in a special election, um, and uh, we, uh, I, you know, we got the second highest number of votes uh, in in Libertarian Party history. I think more importantly, we got the highest number of votes that we've ever gotten during a presidential reelection race. Things are completely different when the entire narrative is built around either keeping someone in office or getting rid of them. It's a lot different than when it's, well, who do we want our next president to be? And people, there's the, the people on the edges that are more likely to go, well, maybe we can go with these people over here that aren't in the, the you know, the old parties. Um, with that said, I think that there were a lot of things that we learned. Um, things that we did right, like the bus tour and, and putting a lot of attention on the down ballot races, recognizing that the likelihood of us winning uh, is obviously much, much, much lower than the likelihood of someone wanting, running for city or countywide race or a state legislative race winning. Um, so I think that we tooled our race in that way. And I think that was good. Um, we were one, we were 100 percent in uh, com, uh, comport or in compliance or uh, in um uh, it's a word I'm looking for. We put forward the libertarian platform. In the past, we've had candidates who go, well, I'm libertarian on this and on this, and I'm mostly libertarian on this, but I don't know, I'm not really libertarian on this or this or this. We were libertarian. We were 100%. We basically took, you know, Joe's uh, campaign platform was basically the libertarian party platform that was reworded to focus on how it benefited people as opposed to what our philosophical belief was. Um, you know, I'm proud of that. We ran a 100% libertarian ticket, not just in part in terms of, you know, recent party membership, but also in terms of actual ideology and salute and, and policies and solutions and, uh, and, 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 and did pretty well on it. Now, in retrospect, I think the biggest mistake that we made, and I was at least somewhat guilty of this, I think I retooled towards the last couple months of the campaign, one of the biggest mistakes that we made was we tried to talk about what we wanted to talk about. And we'd actually pick weeks and say, well, this is gonna be education week, this is gonna be energy week, this is gonna be healthcare week. Instead of recognizing that right now the cultural conversation is way bigger than us. And we are often you know, walking and putting our hands into a waterfall. We can't control the direction of that waterfall. We can't shift the entire opinion of, of public opinion of what we should be talking about, like Donald Trump can with a tweet or like Joe Pi Biden can with a press conference. What we could do is go into those discussions and have the best ideas and pull people in by having the best ideas, the best take on it, the best solutions. And when I started doing that, I found that I got more engagement. I found that I got more uh, people that were, uh, you know, agreeing with us and, and trying to come in and, and, and joining the movement, joining the party, joining the campaign. Uh, in retrospect, it would have been better for us to focus on that. Um, and also, it would have been best for us to really try to hammer down what our main things are that we were talking about. And I think it's clear those things should have been COVID and, and healthcare the lockdowns and just the idea of government being able to tell you whether or not you're essential and order you around like that. Uh, and then especially during the summer, uh, police brutality, the protests, civil rights, you know, um, criminal justice reform, the riots, 
um, we should have been talking about what people were talking about because we have the best ideas for everything. We aren't like Democrats or Republicans where we have certain policies where we have a, you know, a message that really resonates, but then on other ones, we suck on it. Our ideas are great across the board and they resonate well when we present them well. So I think that that's the biggest uh, takeaways that I would have. There were a couple of unforced errors and things that happened along the way. A lot of things that we learned from, I'd say my biggest single mistake initially during the campaign was that I didn't require uh, for the first uh, month after I got the, I, 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 I was, so what happened was prior to the convention, I was pretty much at home like this doing interviews. In fact, you were towards the end of that phase where I wasn't going anywhere and neither was Joe. We were pretty much just at home doing a dozen interviews a day. Then after the, after the actual convention, we were, it was the opposite where we were almost never home. I think I spent a total of like six, six or seven days at home between July and, and the, uh, the campaign. I don't even think it was that much. It was like less than a week. And, and it was spread out over that whole time. In that first month of that second phase where I'm in a different state every single day and, and running around like a crazy person, I didn't realize how important it was to, for me to make sure that I looked at every single thing that was being posted or tweeted or whatever else in my name. I trusted the team I had, and I knew that everything they'd put out so far, I agreed with, uh, and either I had helped be a part of writing it, or it at least was in 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 tune with my style and my belief and my my. And then the the transgenocide post happened, and the problem with that post is that it took data without actually looking at the without qualifying it at all. It took a very very um, hyperbolic take on that data that did not look at the overall data and then came to an even more hyperbolic conclusion that there was an ongoing a, a genocide against trans people. Now, if you look at the data, there shows a, a, a uptick in the number of murders of trans people by like 20 or 30%. What it doesn't say is that a big reason for that is that in that however many years that they've been measuring it, nearly twice or three times as many police departments are now noting whether or not someone's trans. They didn't used to do that. There's also been just a general uptick in murder during that time for everyone across the board. Those two things alone completely eliminate any idea of there being a genocide or even a targeted, you know, a killing of on uh, mass of trans people. Had I made, required that everything that went through uh, under my name be looked at me first, I would have never let that through. I would have looked at the data and said, no, 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 that's not what that says. And we're definitely not putting that out here. That post still haunts me. Um, and understandably so. I allowed it to go out in my name. Uh, it's not even worth saying who put it out there because I'm the person who brought them onto my team. I'm the person that had that didn't have the criteria in place uh, to, to require that I look at everything that goes through. We made that change after the fact so that it doesn't happen again. But that's that was probably the single biggest unforced error was that I was not requiring uh, every single thing that went through to be looked at by me. I now do uh, because I realize now, yes, it could be 99.9% .9 of the time that everything that goes through is all or completely in 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 um, in in tune with my beliefs and, and how I would say something. It only takes that one time. And if it's bad enough, it can it can haunt you. Um, so that was a big thing I learned as well. Do you think that uh, you think that this is good information for for local candidates to really put in their minds when they're running yes. their campaigns? Because uh, kind of like how you said, I, I'll hear libertarians talk about like the rhetoric, you know, and yeah, rhetoric is great, you know, but uh, like what what's going on in your local community and making a policy or showing how a policy on a libertarian level would work is I think far better than just, you know, throwing out rhetoric or thousand throwing out better. the hashtags, you know what I mean? So what do you think uh, locally seems to be the push and I'm digging that. Oh, yeah. I'm digging this push for do this on a local level, go into your backyard, know, get to know your neighbors, build these coalitions, mm -hmm. you know, get out and be active in the community. That's, that's something that we're doing here in Delaware. I'm seeing a lot of um, the, the libertarian guys coming Absolutely. together and wanting to do mm -hmm. these things together. And, and, you know, not, not to qualify, not to just be like, Hey, we're the group of libertarians, but you know, Hey, yeah, we're, we're the group of libertarians. We're out here in the community. We're cleaning it up. We want you to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're with us hundred percent or not, 
come out, interact with us, be with us, do yeah. this community service because we all live here. So let's get to know each other. Yeah. Yeah. Community service. Um, also going to your legislative meetings, going yep. to city council meetings, going to county council meetings, going to state legislative meetings. If you're in Delaware, you can do all three. It's a small enough state. You can, yeah. you can pretty much go to any of those things uh, anywhere that you live in Delaware because of the size of it. Um, but go to those things, not just because we're right and we have the best ideas, but also because other people get to see it. Honestly, at the city and county level, you can sometimes pull some of these city council people and county council people over to your side on a subject. It's it's not until you get to the state legislative level and the congressional level that it's almost impossible to do that unless you're actually setting up a lobbying firm and doing advertising or whatever. If you're in, especially in smaller towns and counties, you can go in with the and and make yourself known and develop relationships and friendships with the people there, and then you can. Show Show them that we have the best ideas on specific subjects. You might not pull them over into full, you know, phil philosophical rock party and libertarianism, but at the very least, you could get them to recognize why decriminalizing uh, marijuana or decriminalizing drugs or decriminalizing uh, anthenogens or, or, you know, psychedelics or whatever, why that's actually a good thing. Uh, or you could get them behind why cash bail needs to be reformed or eliminated, or you could get them behind why you shouldn't have to have a building permit to, uh, to you know, put up a flag or something like that, you know, little stupid things that are affecting people every day, you can get in there and present a good, legitimate and, and compelling argument for why uh, this should be. And again, like you said, focusing on why it works and why it's a solution. A as libertarians, we tend to think as uh, moralists more so than consequentialists or utilitarians. Like we don't think about, we aren't libertarian because it works the best. We're libertarian because it's right. You shouldn't hurt people. You shouldn't take their things. You shouldn't violate someone's autonomy and self-ownership, right? But for most people, it's like, all right, but does it work? That's why, you know, you say taxation is theft and then they go, all right, well, how else are we going to have roads and schools? And we get frustrated because we're like, what do you mean? How else? Are we, you, you, it's okay to rob people? Yeah, for a lot of people, they feel like it's okay to rob people because they've been told their whole lives that this type of robbery is okay and necessary. And we're not in that moment telling them what the alternative is. And they're not going to sign off on something that might rob their children of an education or rob them of the ability to drive somewhere uh, because you don't think that it's moral. So you have to explain how these things would work better, or you should explain how these things should work better. And we can actually pull them in. We have the best ideas. So why argue with them? Um, we The reason we need to focus on local races is because A, we can win them now. We are winning them now. And B, we can win so many more when we focus more of our attention on the races that we actually have a serious shot of winning we can win a thousand of them at a time or more if we put those resources into it and see if we stop focusing on having heroes that we know almost certainly won't win their races and when instead we make our heroes people like Kalish Morrow, Jeff Hewitt, uh, Kara Schultz, Cassandra Fryman, Jim Turney, uh, all, all these people across the country who have, uh, Marshall Burt, all these people who have won their races, won their elections, now we're killing that narrative that the L in libertarian stands for lose. That, you know, if that L's next to their name, they're just not going to win. Yeah, they do win sometimes. And look at what they do when they win. It changes everything. It changes the bad narratives for why people shouldn't vote for us. It brings people in by showing them how our ideas work. And it gets us way more victories and gives us something to feel like we're moving ahead so that we're less likely to attack each other and start nesting and, and you know, coping with the fact that we don't win. Let's, let's, be, let's build a culture of winning starting at the grassroots up. And I think building that culture of winning is, is something important that, uh, in my view, at least, was neglected for a long time. I feel like yes. it was more important to be, you know, hey, we need to stand on the pedestal and be loud so that everybody knows that we're here. Right. But not, you know, it's not, if it's not translating into wins, if it's not translating to us affecting policy, what good does it do? I mean, you're just standing on a pedestal being loud. Um, well, what, happen what happens is the idea was – Look at all these existing libertarians that are out there. We don't even need to talk to the normies yet or worry about the, the old brass tacks of how to win an election. We need to focus on bringing people in 
first and foremost, and at the detriment of everything else, at the, at the cost of everything else. And so we focused on saying taxation is theft and end the wars and end the Fed, all good things. We shouldn't stop saying those things, but it was all we said. And when people you know, would ask more deep and probing questions, because they're normies that don't even know what we're talking about, we would talk past them to all these libertarians, but we saw what that got us. How many libertarians are out there who vote Republican or some that vote Democrat because, well, at least they win? Yes, I agree with you 100%. Yes, the Libertarian Party most accurately and, and, and closely reflects my beliefs and my values and what I think will solve the problems, but you have a shot in hell of winning. So I'm going to keep voting Republican. And so then we get this other group of people that comes in and goes, listen, the number one thing is we have to just win elections. That's it. That's it. I don't care what your policies are. I don't care what your beliefs are. I don't care what your values are. Win, 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 win. That's going to bring people in. The problem is if you don't have a compelling reason for people to vote for you, and if you don't present yourself as a real substantive contrast from these other two parties that have an exponentially higher chance of winning than you do, then you're not giving them a compelling reason to vote for you. If you present yourself as some kind of milk toast, watered down, slightly better alternative than the Republicans, then people are going to look and go, well, I mean, if you're only a little bit better and a little bit different, then why the hell should I vote for you when you're almost likely, almost certain to lose, right? The, this is the false dichotomy or the lesser evils were presented uh, within this party in this movement that we either need to be watered down milk toast because that makes us relatable. It does not, but that's the idea behind it. Or we have to become, you know, edgy and, and talk past people and, you know, not meet people where they are because that's what excites and, and inspires people to join it doesn't it makes us unelectable and inspires people to walk away to their lesser evil of, of the republicans or democrats the answer is to meet people where they are to demonstrate that we care to show that we have the best ideas or that we have the best understanding of how we got here and then to present our solutions and to focus on the races and the areas where we can win and then work our way up from there that's what a culture of winning looks like we are winning the arguments and debates that are happening across this country. We are winning people over to our ideas and our culture. We are winning the political races and we are winning in terms of becoming the fastest growing party that is that is steadily supplanting and replacing not just the old parties, but the old way of thinking that we should be putting power in the hands of a very small handful of people who have already demonstrated that when they have that power, they're gonna screw us over. We can win this. We win by changing our idea of how we should be doing it. And it's by rejecting the lies we've been told on both sides. Absolutely. And in growing a party, uh, of course, there's growing pains in growing a party. And oh, one yeah. of the things that we like to do as libertarians is butt heads with each other. I'm sure <laughs> you've seen your fair share. Oh, yeah of that. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. What have you what have you noticed? Because you've been traveling around, you've been going to these conventions, and you've been seeing yep. firsthand yep. some of mm -hmm. these things. A, a lot of it is the caucus battles. I always hear people talk about button heads with the Mises caucus people and and, and the yep. Prags and all that. So do mm -hmm. you see that? Well, and then there's another wave of people who are all liberty unity who are, you know, screw caucuses and all this crap. Let, right, we right, have right. the same end goal. We might have different ideas of how to get there, but we have the same end goal. What are you seeing that's working? Are you seeing anything that's sticking out at any of these conventions? Anything that's really shining forward uh, as we evolve the party? I, I it's, it's different from convention to convention. I am happy to say that overwhelmingly what I'm seeing is a lot more unity than division. Yes, the Mises people show up and vote often mm -hmm. as a block. But when you look at what they're voting for, it's largely positive, and they bring in a lot of people that agree with them, including some of the Prags. Um, I was not in Pennsylvania, and what I saw in Pennsylvania was the manifestation and the 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 microcosm, the or I guess the the final conclusion uh, or final logical conclusion of what has been warned about on social media. That you know, there's just you know just straight up battle between two groups. Now, even there, I saw some attempts at unity, David fight and others were at sort of the forefront of trying to get some of the people uh, on both sides uh, together to just recognize and remember that we're on the same side here. Uh, but it is unfortunate what happened in, in Pennsylvania and the way that played out. And uh, that's not going to end well in the future. 
um, no matter which side ends up taking over in the future, it's going to the the um, the die has been cast. And unless there are some major changes that happen between now and the 2022 convention, it's just going to be another knockdown drag out. And maybe next time Mises wins, maybe next time the Prags win again. However, it turns out a close to half of the almost half of the party is going to be very very angry and the and the division need not be there when again and, and i say this at every convention i'm at i actually give these little like almost like uh, invocations before business starts and I, I i give a little you know um almost like a pep rally and i'll say who's here to end the wars and you know people cheer and i'll say who's here to end the fed and they'll cheer and i i do this in my zoom because i do a lot of zoom uh, speeches to conventions and other places too. I've been to between Zoom and, and and in person. I've been to like twenty something conventions, and and I'm saying, you know, who's here to do this? Who's here to do that? And it's all stuff we all agree on. And then I'll say, now who here didn't clap for any of that? Silence. And I'll say, the silence that you hear is the sound of you not having any enemies in this room. We are a small movement of people that is way vastly outnumbered, outgunned, outfunded by people who want to keep and grow the status quo of people being enslaved essentially by the system, being robbed blind for the benefit of cronies at their direct expense, being shoved into wars and cages and, and, and criminal records and poor communities and segregated into underperforming schools and all the, all the things that we are against. And we are the only ones with the solution to fix it. And everyone in here agrees also almost 100% on what those solutions are. And often what we disagree on is things like strategy and messaging, things that can work themselves out by seeing what works and what doesn't. So it's not to say you shouldn't argue, which is a waste of time. Don't tell libertarians not to argue. They'll just argue even harder. But what I am telling you is you don't have enemies here. So stop treating each other like that or you will become enemies. So let's avoid that and focus on what we agree on and work together. And, uh, you know, it has been uh, mixed success on that. I will say overall, uh, it has been largely successful in, in creating unity and reminding people, if nothing else, even if we're going to disagree on this stuff, reminding people we still we have the same goal here. And to whatever extent we can work together, let's do it. And if we can't work together, then maybe we just work separately parallel to each other until we're able to work together. You know, just because we aren't working right together, maybe we don't get along, doesn't mean we have to actually work against each other. We can just work parallel to one another. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that fully. Um, I really do. And I think, I think it's working together, whether we don't have to like each other. Uh, I, uh, there's definitely people who don't like me. <laughs> there's definitely people that I don't like, yeah. but, but we don't have to like each other. But if we have the same end goals, we yep. should be working together, especially because, and maybe I'm wrong on this, or maybe you agree with me. But uh, last week, I talked to these fellows from the Sound Mind Creative Group who are working on a great documentary uh, called uh, Follow the Science on Lockdowns and Liberty, in which they're documenting and trying to outreach and, and touch base with, you know, people who have, you know, the small businesses that have crumbled because of, you know, these, these extreme efforts uh, in the pandemic and right. all that. Mm -hmm. I, I have the sense from from my friends who aren't libertarians, but you know, they touch base with me because I am and they wonder my opinion of things. I see them just, they're in this overly excited mode because you know, oh, mandates are gone now and uh, life is kind of opening back up and things are getting back yeah. to normal. And I'm like, people are so quick to forget how the last year and a half of their life has been. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, they're so eager to, they're so eager to have it back. It doesn't really, so sometimes it feels like they don't care that that it didn't have to be that way. And I think the yeah. time is ripe for libertarians. Would you agree that the time is ripe right now still for libertarians to dive in on this and say, no, stop treating this like like everything is fine. Everything's not fine. We, we everything's not fine. Period. This everything was not fine and it didn't do. And this is the thing we need to harp on because. Yes, the reason we need to fight this is because it was the greatest writ large infringement on the lives of everyday Americans that we have seen since World War II, really. Like it was everyone, almost, almost everyone was affected by this, being told whether they were essential or not. Something like 90% of the population was affected in some way or another by some restriction or lockdown or mandate of some kind or another. We need 
and, and it didn't work. That's, but that's why we're, we're against it because it was wrong. Again, this is that consequentialist versus moralist thing. We're against it because it was wrong. But the average person is going to go, well, yeah, but, but if it slowed the spread of COVID and, and, and saved lives, and I guess that we just, you know, sometimes you got to break a couple eggs. If we can show that the eggs were broken for no reason, if we can show that these lockdowns, when we show that these lockdowns didn't work, that in some cases they may have made things worse. We were actually creating the conditions for cold and flu season by telling people to only go outside for essential business all together at the same time and then go back home and stay in their houses with their immediate loved ones. We know that 80 something percent of the people that caught COVID and ended up hospitalized or 70 something percent of the people that caught COVID and were hospitalized were sheltering in place. And that makes sense. That's why cold and flu season is when uh, it's the worst is during the cold is because people are more likely to only go outside for the things they need to do and then come inside and stay inside in poor ventilation with, the, with their family members. That's how they spread it. We are able to show this de data now. And it is crucial that we do it. And I get a lot of pushback from libertarians. You're focusing on the fact that it didn't work, but not on the fact that it was an infringement. The reason I'm focusing on that is I, anyone who is against the lockdowns because it was an infringement, I don't have to sell that to them. They already know it was bad. Even if the data showed it worked 100% in slowing the spread of COVID, they still would be against it just like I was, right? I want to get the people who right now think that that worked because the next time that they do it, those people will think it worked and that it's a good thing to do. Well, I guess it's time to lock down again. We got to do what we can to slow the spread of, of whatever the disease is now. When we can show them it didn't work and that these vaccine passports that they're in, talking about introducing long after COVID is not going to be a problem anymore, which by the way, I think we have successfully, I think libertarians and anti uh, vaccine passport people and anti lockdown people have successfully You'll notice that that's kind of gone away. They've kind of, they're still working on it, but the idea of this big rollout they were going to do later this year, that's kind of gotten shelved indefinitely because, yeah. and this proves, side note here, uh, all government power is illusory. It's, 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 it's what we are willing to accept, right? Which is why we have to constantly shift that over to window towards people accepting less and less bullshit from government. I'm sorry, am I allowed to swear on this? Yes, you are absolutely 100% okay. allowed to swear. Bullshit from government. Uh, and so what we need to do is, in this case, hammer away on the fact that it didn't work. The lockdowns didn't work. And we said, I have a video from last March where I was voluntarily quarantining because I thought that I may have gotten COVID. And we didn't know how long it stayed in your system afterwards. I voluntarily quarantined for nearly a month after I got sick. And during that voluntary quarantine, I made a video, the first of many, explaining why lockdowns don't work and why we needed to focus on voluntary solutions. And then later on, talking about the fact that the reason COVID spread so wildly out of control was because the CDC didn't allow testing and they were shoving COVID patients in nursing homes and mental health facilities. They created the conditions for this pandemic. When we do that, then we change the conversation instead of, man, this pandemic's terrible. You know, sometimes government's just got to come in and tell us what to do. Cause you know, if we left our own devices, we're, we're going to just going to spread it wildly. They just got to do it. Sometimes you just got to keep your head down. And it's really unfortunate what happened with the lockdowns, but we just got to do it. If we change the conversation to it was the government that made this damn thing so bad to begin with. And then they used it as an excuse to impose themselves on you and tell you whether or not you're essential. And that either didn't make it worse at bet, didn't make it any better at best and potentially even made it worse at worst, now all of a sudden government is the is identified as the bad guy here correctly and voluntary solutions are, are correctly identified as the best way to deal with it. So that is 100% what we need to be doing, not just to make it a point that this was wrong, but also to potentially combat the stuff that's coming next because that wasn't some odd thing. Uh, you know, people got mad when, uh, when the Libertarian Party tweeted lockdowns were a trial run. I'm not sure they were a trial run. They were just the first chance to get to do this. And, and that ain't going away until we kill it by changing public opinion on it. Uh, no, absolutely. And and unfortunately, we're battling a, a, a media that isn't friendly towards us at all because uh, there's a yep. certain governor who, um, you know, put a lot of elderly people in shelters and caused their death rates to skyrocket. And he got a book deal about how good he did multiple governors and Andrew Cuomo was the was the the big example but it happened in Michigan it happened in Ohio 
it happened in Washington and it happened. There's another state I'm forgetting right now. And I, was it Wisconsin? It happened in a few states that we know of, and it probably happened in other states, but it was just on a, a smaller scale. So it didn't, you know, there weren't thousands and tens of thousands of deaths as a result of it. Oh, and Cuomo lied too. Yeah. He lied to investigators about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. here we have definitive, this isn't, you know, black helicopter stuff or tinfoil hat stuff. Out in the open, they created the conditions to make it worse. Then they lied about it. And then they used a panic that they created and used it as an excuse to tell you that they know better how you should live your life than you. And that only they have the authority over your life to tell you whether or not you are essential whether or not you should be allowed to go outside. Now, we understand that that is morally and ethically enough reason to oppose it. But many other people, when they're told that, they go, well, I guess if, you know, if that's what it takes to save lives, then I guess we got to do it because they're not being told the alternative. It is imperative. We are the only ones with the right idea on this. We have to be the ones out there, not just on this, on everything. When the government lies to people and continues to rob them blind and impose themselves upon them and throw them in cages and give them undue criminal records, send them off to ridiculous wars and genocides, lets them come home broken if they even come home alive at all, subjects them to the absolute worst form of health care in this country, all these different terrible things, takes children, puts them in shit schools to prepare them for their life of prison or poverty or welfare or homelessness. When we come with our ideas by meeting people where they are in their spaces and from their understanding, and instead of just telling them that taxation is theft, explaining that we care, that we understand how we got here, explaining how we got here, and then explaining how our solutions fix this, we don't just win people to our side. We set people free. We are the liberation movement, and this is how we do it perfect segue for this because you're coming here to delaware june yes. 4th and june 5th june 4th you're coming mm -hmm. to an event that we're having called liberty speaks uh yes. which is it's hosted by the libertarian party of delaware sponsored mm -hmm. by anthem planning and it's going to be at uh pizza dilly winery uh and vineyard and then uh, you're also coming to the libertarian party of delaware convention uh on the 5th mm -hmm. uh but the yep. liberty speaks event that's what this event is about is it not I, we're going to have people we're gonna have you we're gonna have michael heiss uh, angela mccardle mosh Ture of black guns matter and a host of other great speakers mm -hmm. yeah 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 talk a little bit about this what what are you coming to delaware to talk at liberty speaks for what, what is this event highlighting so what i'm going to be talking about is how far we've come in just the past few months because i started this year by saying folks you know I wasn't, I was just as disappointed with the results as you are. Here's what we need to do to win. And then at every single convention, I would watch people either react positively to what I was saying and say, yeah, let's do that. Or they'd say, yeah, we're way ahead of you. We already, we got the same lesson from it. You did. That's what we're doing right now. So what I'm going is to kind of give an update on that. Uh, I, I uh, always implore people to, you know, use winning strategies for messaging to people. Uh, talking to people, I'm going to kind of uh, update people on what I've been doing, leading by example, and, and how we can go into communities and show people that we uh, are, are the best solution and, and our ideas are the best solutions for what people are facing um, and to set people free. Um, and uh, yeah, basically just a recap of what's been going on and talking about how to build a culture winning. How, how do you win? How do you um, shift from this sort of startup phase that we're in right now where we've We've sort of been a proof of concept, right? We started 50 years ago in uh, uh, Colorado, I forget the name of it, in a guy named Luke Zell's living room. It was like a handful of people. Up for the last 50 years, it has been kind of a proof of concept. Are we able to get on enough state ballots to actually win the election if we got enough votes? Yeah. Uh, are we able to get on all 50 state ballots? Yeah. Are we able to field candidates, serious candidates in all 50 states? Yeah. Are we able to win races in all or most of those 50 states? Yeah. Are we reaching a point where a, a, a large number of people have even heard of us? Yeah. Uh, have we been able to bring in other people who are already part of the old parties and have them join and switch to our ticket? Because not only do they agree with our ideas and our values and beliefs, but they don't see our, our name as an albatross that keeps them from getting reelected. Yeah. 
We've done all that. Have we been able to win state legislative races? Yeah. Are we positioned now to be able to win some, some federal races and statewide races? Yeah. Now it's time to get out of that. We are out of proof of concept. It's now time to move on to actual deliverables. It's time to actually get thousands of libertarians elected at the levels that we're already at. It's time to get dozens or hundreds of libertarians elected in statewide races, federal races. It's time for us to actually reach a point where we can qualify for the debate stage, not by begging for it, not by hashtag let me participating it, but by actually winning by their standards, having so much groundswell of support that they can't ignore us. Even if they ratchet up the restrictions for what it takes to get on the debate stage, we outperform that because they can't ignore a group of people where you know, if we get to 15, 20, 20% support, that's one out of every five to seven people wants us to win nationwide. That can't be ignored. It's time to get there. And you get there by building a culture of winning. You get there by focusing on the races you can win. You get there by bringing people into the movement, by consistently demonstrating the best ideas presented in a way that connects with everyday people. And you win by working your way up through the grassroots. And that's, that's what the speech will be on. I'm excited to hear what Michael has to say. I'm excited to hear what Angela has to say. Uh, I think Steve Sheets is going to be there. I'm excited to hear what he has yep, to say. Yep. I'm excited to hear what I, I love Maj. I, I have nothing but good things to say about him. I'm excited to hear what Maj has to say. Um, I'm excited. To, uh, there's a guy, Anthony, um, I forget his name, but uh, I, I haven't really heard much about him, but I'm told that he's going to be a lot of fun to, to listen to. I'm excited for this and, and I'm excited for that. I'm not as excited for the 5K because uh, I am a <laughs> middle-aged Jew with MS and uh, uh, I will probably be sauntering uh, or maybe, you know, a little a brisk walking the, the 5K. You're not going to see me running very far, um, but I am uh, I am looking forward to participating in all this. And then, of course, the following day is the actual convention. And then on Sunday, we're doing a... Uh, uh, a breakfast at uh, Dave Casey's place. Uh, uh, it's a converted farm stand that's now yep. a restaurant. So I, I'm enjoying, I'm looking forward to the weekend, man. I, I am, uh, you know, people keep joking. Oh, you're being whisked away to beautiful Delaware. I enjoy Delaware. Every time I go there, even before the campaign, I, every time I go to Delaware, I love it. I love Delaware. I like it. I like the vibe. I like the area. I'm from Baltimore originally. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of that same kind of vibe of where I lived yeah. in, in, in suburban Baltimore. I, I like Delaware. So I, I'm really looking forward to being there and yeah, meeting no. you. I get to meet you. Yeah, exactly, man. I can't wait to have you here. And, and Delaware, especially ever since I moved a little bit south, you know, a little bit lower, <laughs> been really, yeah. really loving it. Um, newfound appreciation for Delaware. Uh, Man, I've had you. I've had you for almost an hour. I know you got stuff to do tonight, so let's wrap it up, man. Um, anything? Uh, throw out your social links. I know you've been on Clubhouse too. You've been doing that, and it's great to see. Yeah, Liberty guys hitting up Clubhouse because that thing's going off like fire as of late. Dave, Dave Smith, yes, just the group. So, um, any any social links you want to throw out, and and your final thoughts, and we'll close out, man. Sure. So, um, social, uh, is, uh, so I have two shows that are on, uh, the, um, muddied waters media. Uh, you can find muddied waters media on all podcasting platforms on all social media platforms, any, anywhere that you watch or listen to things on the internet, you can find muddied waters media, or you can go to us at muddiedwatersmedia.com. Uh, me personally, you can find spike Cohen on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, now on Clubhouse. Uh, you can find me pretty much everywhere. I'm even on TikTok. I don't really do much on TikTok. I, I don't understand the kids and their humor, but uh, but I, I I I have kids on my on my social media team who are gently nudging me into doing more stuff onto TikTok. But I'm on all the main social media platforms. Uh, you can go to spikecohen.com to find out more. Uh, in fact, this summer, everything is going to change, and we have a very very exciting. Uh, announcement and news coming up later this summer, uh, and everyone can be a part of it. We are about to set America free in a major way. Uh, and I, I hope that you join us. If you want to be among the first to find out what that announcement is later this summer, go to spikecohen.com slash first and sign up now. Um, I guess the one thing I'll leave you with is as libertarians, we are often in groups that we wish were a lot bigger at conventions, at meetings and meetups online and things like that. Um, and, you know, there will be a few dozen of us, maybe a couple hundred of us. And we look around and we think, man, we're in a nation of hundreds of millions of people. 
you know, this seems hopeless. You know, we're outgunned, we're outnumbered, we're outfunded at 10,000 to one. I don't know if we can really do this. And I want you to realize something. If you look at every single major movement that has resulted in people being freer and living better lives as a result, the Magna Carta, uh, um, the, uh, the American Revolution, uh, the abolition of slavery, civil rights movement, any, any of these things, and, and many other, the peasant revolts that happened during the Middle Ages. When you look at any of these things, they all started with small groups, sometimes handfuls of people, sometimes people just in a living room together who looked at the odds that were in front of them and did not care how hopeless it looked. They didn't care how high the odds were stacked up against them. They didn't care if their loved ones were telling them it was you know, a waste of time and just to give up. They didn't care if it was a threat to them to continue doing so because they knew the only alternative to continuing to fight and fight and fight until they won was just to shrug their shoulders and say, I guess this is how it's going to be. They refuse to give up just like we refuse to give up. We are growing. We are taking over bit by bit. Our ideas are winning in the marketplace of ideas and we're just getting started. Liberty will win. People will be set free from wars and from cages and from criminal records and from uh, the spiraling cost of living going out of control. They will be set free from this and it will be because of you and you will be who are remembered for this. The trailblazers, the original group of the remnant who looked at the odds and said, no, I will never give up until we win. Liberty will win. It will be because of you and we are just getting started. Spike, thank you for coming back on the show. Uh, and I cannot wait to meet you and Tasha coming up next weekend, man. Thank you, man. I look forward to it. All right, guys, that's it. That'll do it for me for this week. That was Spike Cohen uh, on FritzCast for the second time. Very, very happy to have had him back, man. Really, really enjoyed that conversation. Uh, the links are provided below and, and for Spike's social media, if you're not already following him, I don't know if you noticed this, but they were kind of on screen the whole time for those of you watching. For those of you listening, I know that's kind of bum. Yeah, I'm poking fun at you for not being a YouTube watcher, but uh, in any case... The links are below. Uh, the links to Delaware's events are below, which the, the Delaware event, Liberty Speaks, uh, on June 4th is free. Come on, to get your event bright ticket and come on down and check it out and hang out with us libertarian folks. Brian Nichols is going to be there. He's really excited to... He, all these great people speaking and stuff, and Brian's excited to meet me. Weird. Weird. He also likes the Dallas Cowboys. We don't like to talk about that, though. Guys, I love you. Uh, uh, next week, I have to I have to play it uh, I have to play it uh, by ear on the episode next week because uh, the the convention and uh, Liberty Speaks coming up. Perhaps I'll do some stuff from uh, one or or both of those events. Perhaps I will. Maybe some live streaming or something. See see if we can work something up. I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll play that one by ear. Okay. We'll play that one by ear. If I don't see you next week, then I'll see you the following week with recaps on all that stuff. And remember, I love you. You can catch me at FritzQS on Twitter, Facebook.com slash TheFritzCast. If you're on YouTube, you're watching, but search YouTube for FritzCast. And if you need to reach me, FritzCastPodcast at gmail.com. Take it easy. Enjoy your weekend.